Hey everyone, it's Saoirse, and today I want to talk to you about Children of Dune by Frank Herbert. I've been working my way um, steadily through the series, and this one was by far the most difficult to read, to understand, um, all of that. We'll get into it. This was published in 1976, and as I said, it's just confusing. Just confusing. And I will inevitably sound pretty unintelligent talking about it, I'm sure. Because it gets real meta, it gets real, um... Not philosophical, well, maybe a little bit philosophical, yeah. A lot of real political stuff in here that I could have done without. But overall, we're just going further into those themes of prescience reading the future, um, knowing which paths are branching out and, and which one leads to what, blah blah blah. I'll read you the back here, so... Also, spoilers. There will be a lot of spoilers in this. The children of Dune are twin siblings, Leto and Ganema Atreides, whose father, the Emperor Paul Muad'Dib, disappeared into the desert wastelands of Arrakis nine years ago. Like their father, the twins possess supernormal abilities, making them valuable to their manipulative aunt Aaliyah, who rules the empire in the name of House Atreides. Facing treason and rebellion on two fronts, Aaliyah's rule is not absolute. The displaced House Carino is plotting to regain the throne, while the fanatical Fremen are being provoked into open revolt by the enigmatic figure known only as the Preacher. Aaliyah believes that by obtaining the secret of the twins' prophetic visions, she can maintain control over her dynasty, but Leto and Ganema have their own plans for their visions and their destinies. <clears throat> Basically, the main things that happen in this book that you need to grapple with are Aaliyah becomes possessed um, by Baron Harkonnen. So there's this whole thing where if you are pre-born, um, which is like what happened to Aaliyah where uh, Jessica did the whole spice thing where she received all the lives of the previous reverend mothers, um, and she was pregnant with Aaliyah at the time, it made Aaliyah awaken in the womb and have all of these lives put into her. So when she was born, she already knew everything. Um, <clears throat> and the same thing happens to the twins, Leto and Ganema. So they're nine years old, they're crazy smart, they're like old, wise people. So Aaliyah becomes possessed because when you have all of these lives, going on inside of your head, you can be swayed by some of them um, who want to take your body over and control what you're doing so they can finish whatever they wanted to do and didn't get to while they were alive. So because um, Baron Harkonnen is Aaliyah's grandfather, he easily takes over her mind and she becomes what they refer to as an abomination because she's possessed now. So it's really sad because, like, Aaliyah was just a little kid. You know, she was just like a baby in the first one. And then she was an adolescent in the second book and you're rooting for her, you want her to be good. And then this happens to her, which is just not her fault, I don't, I don't think. But they do show us how Leto and Ganema, they fight against the same forces that Aaliyah couldn't, um, couldn't fight. So, whatever. I don't know. That's, that's the main, that's the first main thing. And then we have the whole plot line about the twins <clears throat> and how the Carinos want to kill them. Um, and this is where it gets really political. And they send these crazy tigers to go kill the twins, but the twins know about it, so they they totally thwart this and they manage to kill the tigers and pretend that Leto has died, so Ganema returns alone. Um, <clears throat> so there's that plot line. And then we have one of the craziest things I've ever read in my life. Leto fuses himself with sand trout which is like sandworm babies, I think, and he he puts, he gets all these like, it sounds like leeches, like these sand trout are just all over him, 
become his body pretty much. He can't remove them. He's no longer fully human. And this gives him the, the ability to live for thousands of years. So that happened. And then we have uh, the revelation that the preacher is Paul, which from the beginning, that's what you're kind of hoping and expecting. But what a weird ending for Paul, because we think he's died at the end of the second book where he wanders off into the desert to die. But then he, he comes back and he's just this weird preacher guy who's walking around with a guide, um, basically talking trash against whatever his mistakes were and what his family is currently doing. And I just... Just a moment, let me just breathe for a moment, because I just couldn't cope with it. Because you want Paul to come back and have, like, a meaningful story still. And yet what happens, spoiler, is at the end, Paul and Aaliyah both die. One right after the other. Like, and Jessica's right there and she sees it. And I'm just so confused. I'm so confused. I'm... All of this stuff leading up to Leto finally um, confronting Paul and, you know, being like, hey, da daddy, father, whatever, now you're going to be on my side. And then, and then very soon after that, Paul just dies. Somebody just murders him. And it's like, we already went through this guy dying in the last book. And whatever. I, I really struggled like the first half of this book and then I really got into it and I was like okay I'm here for it I'm here for it as always happens with these books um, but I am mad about that anyway and then um, you also have the fact that Jessica has become this like totally flat character I loved her in the first book I thought she was so interesting and so important and now she's just really a one-note character Everybody, the problem that I have with, with um, Herbert's writing is that everybody kind of loses their character development. Like, now we have Duncan, who is brought back from the dead, and Stilgar, who we previously would have respected a lot. He's kind of just, like, lost his Stilgarness, and he kills Duncan Idaho. Which it doesn't even feel like a big deal because everybody keeps dying and coming back to life. So who's to say he won't come back again? But he'll be another watered down version of himself. Whatever. <sighs> Some frustrating things. Clearly, I didn't realize how frustrated I was, but I am gonna keep reading them. I considered at one point in this one, I was like, you know what? You don't have to finish the rest of these books. But for some reason, it's so, it's just so beyond anything I've ever read. It's just so different. Um, and parts of it do feel a little fan fiction-y, but then other parts are, like, just brilliant, so... Whatever, let us take a look at a few things from the book. Now this is Stilgar thinking to himself, How simple things were when our messiah was only a dream, he thought. By, fi by finding our Mahdi, we loosed upon the universe countless messianic dreams. Every people subjugated by the jihad now dreams of a leader to come. So that's a constant theme in these books, is the issue of a messiah and how if you wait around for somebody to come save you, um, that causes some problems because you don't actually take care of what's currently happening, you're just waiting for somebody to fix it. And that allows um, the door to open for any kind of wacky figure to come in and be like, I'm the messiah! Didn't you guys want me? Let's get this party started. Um, yeah, bad things come from that. Let's see, let's see. And he's thinking, Stilgar's thinking about how he could kill the twins. Um, were Muad'Dib's twins responsible for the reality which obliterated the dreams of others? No. They were merely the lens through which light poured to reveal new shapes in the universe. In torment, his mind reverted to primary Fremen beliefs, and he thought, God's command comes, so seek not to hasten it. 
God's it is to show the way, and some do swerve from it. It was the religion of Muad'Dib which upset Stilgar most. Why do they make a god of Muad'Dib? Why deify a man known to be flesh? Muad'Dib's golden elixir of life had created a bureaucratic monster which sat, ast sat astride human affairs. Government and religion united, and breaking a law became sin. A smell of blasphemy arose like smoke around any questioning of governmental edicts. The guilt of rebellion invoked hellfire and self-righteous judgments. So, again, the theme that... Well, I'm glad some things are consistent in these books. <clears throat> this theme of religion being dangerous, and especially not having a separation of church and state. Which makes me wonder, why does Paul go off into the desert and start preaching? Like, if he's... I can't really get a feeling for him. Like, does he think religion is dangerous? Or does he just feel like he brought the wrong religion to people? Um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and Paul's mentions of God when he talks in this book. What the heck is going on? Is my question. Okay. We're going to skip ahead. Um, Jessica thinks this. And, yeah, I'll just tell you. To suspect your own mortality is to know the beginning of terror. To learn irrefutably that you are mortal is to know the end of terror. But now, just alone, I love that statement. Um, because I think, about, I think about death a lot. And usually in a I'm scared kind of way. But to put it like that, when you suspect that you're mortal, that's really terrifying, but knowing for sure you're mortal, well that kind of frees you up to go, okay, well there's no way out of this, I'm going to die no matter what I do, so I might as well have a good time. But within the context of this book, um, immortality is kind of a thing that's talked about a lot. There's another line about, um, like having children is, or like, Becoming immortal is an okay reason to have children, like you're basically immortal because you're furthering your genetic line, um, which don't get me started on my opinions about how selfish that is, but um, then there's a the whole thing about Leto being able to live thousands of years because he's all covered in sand trout. And what is the goal for living so long? You know, why should Duncan Idaho have come back as a Gola? and why some characters like Chani just die super young, and that's it. Why do we have these other lives, like the twins, who are young in years, but have thousands of lives within them, to the point where they're basically ancient beings? What really is immortality? And what is its use? I haven't quite grappled with all of this. These are just my thoughts while reading. I had a lot of crazed thoughts. <clears throat> <clears throat> I should have some water, but I did not prepare. Okay, another thing about Jessica. Um, there's this whole fact about how she went to live on Caladan again after everything happened in Dune in the first book. And it just seemed so out of character and strange that she would, she was like, I thought such a good mother. Well, mm, she did kind of, like, raise Paul to be the Kwisatz Tadarach, which she wanted, um, so selfish. But also she really loved Paul. Like, she really loved him, and it really seemed like she loved Aaliyah in the first book. But then she just pieces out, goes to Caladan, and says, She knew now that she lived on faraway Caladan in an insulated capsule, which had allowed only the most blatant of Aaliyah's ex excesses to intrude. I contributed to my own dream existence, she thought. Caladan had been something like that insulation, provided by a really first-class frigate riding securely in the hold of a guild highliner. Only the most violent maneuvers could be felt, and those as mere softened movements. How seductive it is to live in peace, she thought. So this also made me think of, like, the Titanic and how um, people who were in the, the more undesirable parts of the ship down below felt when the iceberg hit, and the people in like first class barely felt anything, like the water in their glass wouldn't have even moved very much. 
So she has just removed herself to Caladan, and she's living in this existence of who cares? You know, I don't really know what's going on. I've heard that ilya has got some weird stuff happening, but I'm just gonna be here peaceful on my pretty planet. And this part just made me feel like her character, like she just has given up completely. Ooh, excuse me. She's just given up. And I don't like that because in the first book, she was so strong. She was like just this, I thought, really badass character. And now I don't even recognize her, and so I, to me, that's just a writing issue. I don't feel like there was enough explanation for why she would be so different in this book. It just seems like the author kind of twisted characters to fit a certain purpose that he needed for whatever plot he was working on. Anyway. Um, okay, this is Leto. His mind felt suddenly heavy with the multitude of lives which his difference provided him. All of those lives, his even before birth. He was saturated with living and wanted to flee from his own consciousness. The inner world was a heavy beast which could devour him. So I just like this as a line that um, speaks to the danger of having too much knowledge, perhaps. Um, too much knowledge too early. And I wonder why we've got these... We have these examples of people who have the same sort of situation, right? Leah, Ganema, and Leto all have this pre-born thing going for them. And even Paul has a touch of that with his uh, very intense inclination towards being prescient. Um, <clears throat> and we can see how different people go in different directions with these, I don't know if you'd call it gifts that they've been given because they seem more like a curse. Um, but this whole time, like, you want Leto to be good, like, please, can somebody just be good? Can Paul's children just be good? And it seems like he's not leaning that way. He is kind of overwhelmed by all of this, and yet he's such a smooth talker that even the reader is like, I kind of follow you, I see what you're saying, you gotta fix up Dune because, um, all this water is getting rid of the sandworms, and we need the sandworms, we like those big old guys, so... Yeah, go ahead and destroy all the work that they've been doing ecologically to get water to be a thing on Dune and um, bring back the sandworm. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. Anyway, um, okay. Here's the preacher. The preacher lifted his chin to speak over her to the crowd, shouted, I give you Muad'Dib's words. He said, I'm going to rub your faces in things you try to avoid. I don't find it strange that all you want to believe is only that which comforts you. How else do humans invent the traps which betray us into mediocrity? How else do we define cowardice? That's what Muad'Dib told you. I'm like, Paul, my boy, what are you trying here? But I, there's this theme of complacency and comfort, again, going on from what I said about Jessica and Caladan. This idea of religion and following government, um, and waiting for Messiah, all of this just making us kind of have this, we live in this, like, haze where we are just complacent. We feel comfortable because we know what's familiar. Um, we've been waiting for a Messiah forever, and so if there's a Messiah here who says he's the Messiah, we're just gonna listen to what he says. And that's that. And then we can kind of, like, drop everything, we don't need to think anymore. Um, which, yeah, that's definitely a good commentary on humanity as a whole. It's certainly easier to just accept things the way they are, rather than try to change them. <clears throat> this is one of those little things at the beginning of the chapter. The one-eyed view of our universe says you must not look far afield for problems. Such problems may never arrive. Instead, tend to the wolf within your fences. The packs ranging outside may not even exist. Yeah, I just like that line. I just think that's a... That's an important thing to think about. We're always looking for problems beyond um, what is even happening right here. I mean, I know I do this. I just catastrophize into the future as if I could possibly see the future or what's going to happen. Um... Now there's this bit here, 
which is uh, Lido. Now and again he would listen to those memory lives. One would rise like a prompter poking its head up out of the stage and calling cues for his behavior. His father came during the mind walk and said, You are a child seeking to be a man. When you are a man, you will seek in vain for the child you were. This is just a nice little bit about like the inner child and how sad it is that especially these, you know, made up fictional characters can't really have a childhood at all because they've been pre-born so they're already aware of everything in the universe. Um, it's just sad. All this stuff is sad. Like, I don't think there's really been a happy moment in these books, has there? Uh, maybe a couple when Chani was still alive. Okay. What is this? This is about individuality. Uh, every, situ oh, every civilization depends upon the quality of the individuals it produces. If you over-organize humans, over-legalize them, suppress their urges, or urge to greatness, they cannot work and their civilization collapses. Um, so, ooh, sorry. So, yeah. Just another example of um, over-governing. People cannot be individuals anymore. They become this whole mass of humanity as a whole who's just blindly following their usually crooked leader. So, bottom line, <laughs> this was the most complicated book in the series so far. I am sure that it's just going to get more complicated with the next three. Um, there was much less heart to the characters at this point, and I already felt that in the second book. It was already a huge shift, but I still, I still was like, come on, Paul, let's do this. Let's do something good. Why did Paul fail so horribly, is my question. If he knew everything, why did he mess up so bad? And then why did he have to die twice? And whatever. Um, I miss Paul. And I miss people, like, I miss the characters having, having individuality and having, like, a character arc that made sense for them based on what was laid out in the first book. Um, these all kind of feel like completely separate books. Um, and they keep skipping so much time. And I read the back of the next book, so I know we're going to skip a lot more time. So it's like, at that point, is this even a series? It's just, it all takes place on the same planet, but it's like we're not even dealing with the same people anymore. Anyway, I still found it intriguing. You know, venture forth and read these books if you feel like you want, um, you want to handle something completely out there, definitely recommend the first one, and it's up to you if you want to keep going with the rest of them. I'm, I'm still gonna do it, because I still like them. I'm just like, I'm angry about some things, but I still like them. So that was it. Um, nothing more to say, really. Let me know your thoughts if you have read this book, but try not to spoil the next books. Thank you so much, and thank you for watching. I will see you all next time.